Thank you, thank you, thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Barbara. I'm from allbrands.com, a family owned and operated business since 1976. And I am so excited about our guests, guests today. So let's get started. Let us know where you're watching from. Let us know if you're sewing right now, what you're working on, what you're getting into, how you're having fun during this time. And our guest, the sewingmachineproject.org's Margaret Jankowski is an amazing person. She started this, this spark began in 2004 when she was reading an article about a Southeast Asian tsunami. Um, and she was reading an article about a woman that lost her sewing machine. And this was some something that she used as her livelihood. So Margaret felt a calling to provide sewing machines to people in need. And um, that's how she got started. And ever since then, she's been uh, donating machines and education and programs regionally, nationally and internationally. And this time, I think she's donated over 3000 sewing machines to people in need. So we're so excited to have her. Thank you everyone for watching. Hi from California, Texas. Hi, Virginia. Hi, Glenda. Thank you for watching. And Michelle, Pennsylvania, all over the board. Oh my goodness. Laura, thank you for watching again. And Margaret is from Madison, Wisconsin, and she loves to sew too. So I'm so excited. I'm going to be bringing her in. Hi. And, <laughs> hi. Welcome. Oh my Thank goodness. You. <laughs> We're so excited to have you. And uh, thank you for what you do, by the way. Thank you. I'm yes. Um, it's a gift. It's a gift to be able to do it. Yeah. So I have another person that's uh waiting behind the scenes as well. And I felt like we could not have this conversation without the two of you together. My father, the owner of All Brands, John Douthit, I know that you and he have had a long standing history of uh, donations to the sewingmachineproject.org. And I know y'all have some great stories to tell. Well, so yeah. without further ado, <laughs> My father. Hi, John. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So, Margaret, can you tell us a little bit about how you got started sewing and how you started the sewing machine project? I would be happy to. So, um, like you had mentioned, I, I this all got started because I read an article online, and and it was just one of those Saturdays, you know, on a snowy Saturday here in Wisconsin, and I was reading sewing blog because sewing box. And um, I found this article about this woman who had lost her sewing machine in the tsunami. And I, it was just one of those moments that as a sewer, I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know what I would do without my sewing machine. But for this woman, that was a question of survival or starvation. I mean, the sewing machine was her tool and it really hit home. And I really didn't think about how how I would do it or how it would work. I just started collecting sewing machines and the connections I needed were there. And we worked really hard and we started sending sewing machines to Sri Lanka and India. And that was in 2005. And then later in 2005, Katrina hit and then we became connected with the New Orleans area. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah, so it's grown and grown. I mean, it's been 50, it, this is our 15th year. Wow. Yeah. Can't hear you, can't hear you. Okay, sorry, can you hear me now? Yep. I gotta call you dad, because you're my dad. Dad, <laughs> how did you and Margaret get teamed up together to start donating sewing machines? When did you meet? Well, she's a lot younger than I am, so she probably has a lot better memory than I do. But I remember it was around the project, and I don't know if it was a project in New Orleans. Uh, I think I remember one at UNO where we were met down there with the people from the you know, University of New Orleans, 
And I don't know if that was it or Margaret, was it another time? No, I mean, that was, to my memory, John, you reached out to me via email and just said, I, I heard about what you're doing and I'm really interested in helping you. You reached out a helping hand. And at the same time, you also had this great idea to take some machines to the theater department at UNO, like you remember, that's it. Okay, that's because they lost their machines. So, so the, you and I did that together. Yeah. And that was, and, was that during, and that was during Katrina, right? No, that was early 2010. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what is your most, dad, what is your most memorable experience with the sewing machine project? I think it was the project in Haiti. We, uh, we had a hundred brother machines that uh, we needed to get to Haiti through sewingmachineproject.org. And uh, we went through a church in order to get them shipped down to um, first to Dominican Republic. And I think they then transferred them over to a, a church school in, in Haiti. And uh, we, we, this was uh, after the earthquake there. And uh, I, I know that we, we communicated with some of the people after. We never got to go down to Haiti at that time, but uh, we know that the machines were put to good use. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, Delia, for joining us. Well, and it was cool, John. You and I had just met earlier in 2010, and then that earthquake hit, and right away you reached out to me and said, okay, so here's another project. Let's do this now. And, and you gathered the machines, and then I gathered supplies from people up here. Remember, and we shipped everything, I think, to Mississippi to, to yeah, put it up in to, to the port port in Mississippi where the ship took them to um, Dominican Republic first right. and then to the church. But right. we also did a project in Cuba, which was more interesting because it dealt with a church in uh, the Sisters of Charity, I believe it was in, in Havana. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shipped the machines to Miami and put them on a boat that was from Sisters of Charity in Miami to Sisters of Charity in Havana. And uh, Margaret sent a lot, a lot of sewing supplies because yeah. it's not you can't just give machines to people who don't have suppliers. They had to have everything, patterns, fabrics, notions, everything. And then what the most memorable experience was when they, they had a street sale after they'd all made the garments and they sent us pictures of the street sale with the dresses and things hanging out on the street for sale and i asked them what they did with the money that they made from selling the uh, garments at the street sale and it was to buy refrigerators for their homes because they didn't have refrigerators so to me that's the essence of entrepreneurialism if you give people the resources to where they can uh do for themselves and make make way for their family that was a memorable experience Absolutely. Well, and I have to say, I mean, as I think, as we all know, the sewing community is so generous that all, all on our end, all we had to do was put the word out and say, hey, we need supplies, we need fabric, we need thread, we need needles, we need all this stuff. And it just, we just got piles of stuff and financial donations to buy the things we hadn't received. And it, it was just, there was such an outpouring of generosity. It's really something. You, you've done more in New Orleans. I think the most machines have gone to New Orleans after at, Katrina. I'm yeah, sure. yeah. I'd say we're probably at about close to 1,500 in New Orleans. Wow. Yeah. And some of those went to really interesting groups. Uh, I, I remember we met with one of your groups down there that was the Mardi Gras crew. Which one was that? The Mardi Gras Indians, yeah. Indians. We still bring machines down to them, yeah. Wow. Wow. They do such beautiful work and, and they share the machines within their own community. And it's just, it's really cool. Um, but John, you and I have done other ones too. Remember that community center that we took them to? Oh, yes. Yes. Over Memorial, on Memorial Day. You helped me set up machines on Memorial Day. <laughs> and where was that located, Margaret? It was that was in New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, it was in New Orleans. Yeah. 
Um, and I had been contacted. This was one. This is one of my favorite stories. I each when we started coming down and bringing machines for individuals, um, I would we did, had no idea how much need there was. And so the second time that I came down, the church where we were distributing those machines did a um, did a little press release, and I was on the local news. And we had I think sixty five machines in this rented van. And 500 people showed up that day and were lined up down Canal Street. It was, it was amazing. And so I had this big, long list of people. And every time I'd come, I'd just call the next however many people on the list yeah. and distribute machines. But I called this woman named Anna. And she said, I'm, my fiance and I are rehabbing this house in this neighborhood. And the neighborhood's pretty rough right now. And we sure could use a sewing machine to start some classes. And I said, great, um, fine, you know. And she said, well, actually, could we have three machines? And I said, sure. And then after we hung up, she called me back and she said, could we have five machines? And I'm like, OK, you know, sure. So I looked at the machines that I had to bring along and they, they couldn't have been more different, that particular batch, because I was trying to find five that would work together like in a classroom. You know, if they wanted to have a little sewing classroom in this community center and I, they, they couldn't have been more different. And I had to leave my the store where I was working and where I kept my machines. I had to leave for a while. And when I came back, there were five sewing machines lined up inside the front door. And they were exactly alike. And I said to my coworker, you know, what, what are these machines doing here? This isn't where people leave them in service. This isn't, you know, like, what is this? And she said, oh, while you were gone, a sewing teacher stopped in and had these sewing machines. She's had them all refurbished. Um, they're all ready to go. They were all threaded up with nice, bright, new thread. It was amazing. So we brought them down to Anna. And then they, their sewing program really got going. And so I talked to John and he, and then we came down again and then John donated brother machines. So we were able to give him these cool machines, set up a whole classroom. It was, it was amazing. Well, the most interesting place, the thing about that particular place that we, community center was that they converted it from a crack house to a community center. Yeah. And they had a whole sewing room so that's, to me, that's transformational. I mean, you can turn a crack house into a sewing lab. That, that We need to do that all over the country. <laughs> yeah. Ted, you've always taught me something very special that I hold on to. It's not what happens to you. It's how you react to it. And I feel like Margaret's really taken the torch on that and <laughs> mending the world by providing sewing machines and lessons to people who need it for either necessity or for coping mechanisms, you know, absolutely You're having hard times. Can you tell us about maybe one of the most memorable, um, one of the more like experience that touched your heart the most throughout your whole journey? In this oh, my goodness. Um, there have been so many. Um, a lot of a lot of them have happened in New Orleans. To be perfectly honest, um, I, you know, I've met so many people there, um, people who showed up and needed a machine, um, along with the Mardi Gras Indian community. One that really really struck me um, was I came down with a, a bunch of machines, and we had a distribution day. And there was one woman on the list that I'd called, um, but it turned out that she wasn't able to get there on the day that we did the distribution. And I thought, oh shoot, you know, like I, I need to get this to her. So. I'd saved a machine for her um, and hoped that I'd find her while I was in town. And uh, so I gave her a call and she and I agreed she'd, she'd had to work that day and ha wasn't able to make it. And so she and I agreed to meet in this parking lot over on Broad Street. So we had it all set up and we met in this parking lot. Um, I was there waiting and she arrived and and she showed up and she said she hadn't had a sewing machine since she was a little girl. And the story she told me was just so tender. You know, she said, I, I just basically got to use whatever scraps were around. You know, she'd never really had the chance to have her own, you know, new fabric and new anything. But the, the machine I'd brought her was an older machine, but really a familiar machine to her. So it was almost like 
a friend, you know, it was almost like opening, we pulled the open, we opened this case and she's, her breath just caught. And she said, Oh my gosh, that's like the machine that was in my mom's in our house when I was a little girl. And, and I'd brought along a box with all a whole stack of fabric in it. And so she was able to go through it. And, and, you know, I said, you can take whatever you need. And so we, I had supplies and stuff for her. And to me, I mean, that, you know, watching her go, watching her get on the bus with this sewing machine and knowing that here was this tool that not, I mean, for me as a sewer, here's this tool that not only helps you make something, but for me, I, I problem solve when I sew. I, you know, it it is a healing tool for me. And I really hoped that it would be for her too. Um, yeah, those... And, and that happens so often, you know, that happens so often. So dad, what's your most heartfelt moment in uh, your experience of donating machines to the public for Well, we, the most recent one we did was a uh, home ec teacher from uh, Livingston Parish, just east of Baton Rouge. It needed 12 machines for uh, her 4-H projects. And we we had 12 machines that had been donated through uh, project.org and Beth fixed them all up, your husband fixed them all up. And <laughs> then she came and picked them up at the warehouse and we took a picture and all that. But she, we were able to help out a home ec teacher that wanted to get started with 4-H. And 4-H, by the way, is a boon to sewing because they're still teaching sewing uh, and having fashion review contests and so forth. So we support 4-H. Barbara d does the judging at the 4-H University. Yay. Done virtually, it wasn't done in person. They did it uh, on screen. But uh, to me, the 4-H the projects have been the most uh, rememberable to me because it, to see how the kids get started and grow. Barbara has more experience with that than I do, but I'm just ecstatic about what 4-H is doing for sewing. I love 4-H. Um, Margaret, have you ever done anything through the 4-H program? Um, we've we've donated to different 4-H clubs. Yeah. Um, one of them, one of the ones that I mean, just pops into my head because John, we collaborated on this one too, um, was when a few years ago when we, um, when I was collecting machines um, for Houston after the hurricane. Yeah, and one of the one of the recipient groups was a 4-H group that not only lost their machines, they lost their building, they lost everything, and so some of the machines that I'd collected went to them. Um, but yeah, we've had lots of well, lots. I'd say probably ten or fifteen 4-H groups that we've that we've donated sets of machines to. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, to me, we, we got started with 4-H. Well, I, my, I grew up in FFA, and my wife grew up in 4-H. And uh, so, so we've always felt that we should support the groups we grew up with. And uh, when Annette started judging the 4-H University at LSU contest, and then I got involved in it, and then finally Barbara succeeded me, and she's still judging. And uh, it's really. A, a I just wonderful. finished the judging, yes. actually, and I'm I'm so inspired by the leadership and initiative of the young people through that program. I do yeah. feel that when they are constructing a garment from start to finish, they learn a lot about how to buy, how to wear, and how to just be consistent in, in making something for themselves and being able to show it off with pride. And I was just so inspired by those young girls. Um, it gave me a big boost. So, so yeah. Um, can y'all tell me a little bit about, um, I know Margaret, you do like some regional classes on like mending and repurposing, which is beneficial for people who don't have the money to go out and buy brand new clothes like some of us have the luxury to do 
Right. Can you tell us a little bit about those regional classes that you hold? You, you bet. Um, we started our local our local initiatives back in about around 2011, I think, um, and we we have kind of two, a two pronged um, approach to our work in the community. We do offer local classes. Um, we partner with community centers in the area, and the centers actually um, come up with the class list. They identify the people. Um, their, among their clients that really could use um, some help. And we come in and we offer a six week course in beginning sewing and we teach people how to use the machine, um, how to care for the machine and, and pretty basic sewing. Um, but incorporated into that is how to, how to fix what you have um, as well as how to move forward and make something new. So we kind of do both. Um, but the really super cool part about it is that um, once students attend for the six weeks and they work on the same machine every week, that at the end, at the end of those six weeks, they get to keep the machine that they learned on, which is really cool. Um, so we've been doing that for, for several years. And most of the groups um, so jazzed about it that we move on and we do an immediate class and we teach them how to read a pattern and we teach and you know, more and more um, because they're just so excited to be sewing. And I love to see that. I love to see new sewers. Um, um, the other thing that we do is we um, we offer a, a free mending at three different sites here in Madison. So at a community center, at our central library, and then at the Beacon, which is a day center for um, people experiencing homelessness. And so we have different schedules for each place and our volunteers man the mending table on for two hour shifts. We have two volunteers at a time and it's free to anybody. So anybody that brings something, we try to mend it. Um, we empower our menders to say no if it's something that's too hard. But most of the time um, we're able to fix what people have and um, not only are we able to repair, you know, really beloved garments or, you know, whatever, mend the holes in their pockets or, or whatever they need. Um, but it also, typically the people that are having things mended sit down at the table and, and just have a real easy conversation. Um, quite often, it's been my experience that people will say, you know, when I was a little kid, my grandma sewed or, or I, you know, I learned how to sew buttons on, but I don't really remember anymore. Um, and there were enough comments like that that we wrote a grant a few years ago um, to buy supplies that we have in a little box at each site. And as people talk about the kind of mending they wish they could do, we create their own little special mending kit that they can take with them. Um, so if they need to sew buttons on, they get threaded needles and a bag of buttons. And if, you know, they, they we just kind of put it together depending on what their needs are. Um, and so now going forward, we're super excited because um, our next, our kind of our next step is we're creating a curriculum around mending and repurposing that we'll offer to the community centers here, but then I'll also offer it to any group that, that would like that curriculum nationwide so that other groups can do it too, because it's really powerful, really, really powerful. Yeah. And I think not only for people who, you know, need it for necessity, I think that it's also good for the environment to mend yeah. your clothes as well. So, you know, something like that might have a dual purpose. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have a few highlight uh, topics that I wanted to talk about um, that, um, you know, we that we went over and um, one of them was, uh, it, I just wrote Alabama Group. Oh, okay. Can y'all tell us about Alabama Group? Absolutely. <laughs> well, can I share some pictures while I do it? Oh yeah, sure. Is it okay. Um, so the Alabama Group is the ladies from G's Bend, the quilters. Oh, okay. Um, and they, let me find them. There's John and I, what? Um, <laughs> dad, you, oh, bring that one up. That's funny. Okay. Look at, look at you that's look different what, without your Santa beard, dad. Yeah. <laughs> that's the first time we met. Yeah. Um, oh 
but anyway, the Alabama group is the G's Ben Quilters, and I knew of them because I'd seen I had seen their show um, when their quilts traveled toured internationally. Um, and I was so taken with their quilts. And so I just gave them a call back in like 2008, maybe. I just went online and found any phone number I could find. And um, I gave I gave a call and, and Marianne Petway, one of the quilters answered the phone and I said, Could, you know, do you need anything? I, I really would like to come and visit and see where you are and see and meet you. And she said, oh, well, you know, if you have any machines or you have any fabric, so, um, yeah, so we, so, so I have made several, probably five trips down. I love this picture. I asked, I asked each of the women to pick a quilt that was, that they had made. Wow. Um, and so, you know, and so we were able to give them, give them machines and give them fabric and, and they, you know, they, they do get support from, from people, but, but I don't know, we, we made a real special connection. The last time that I went, um, they, uh, th we, they invited us to stay overnight. So I was with two friends and, and we stayed overnight and had dinner and it was just, it was lovely. So it's developed into kind of a sweet little friendship, you know, and the first time that I went, it's such a, it's such a non, you know, it's just this little building in this little tiny town in Alabama. And I was alone and I was driving along and I knew I was in the, the area, but I couldn't find the building. And so I just pulled over and I called this number that I'd called originally. And I said, I can't find you. And I looked across the street and this woman like comes out of a house and she's like, I'm right here. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, it was it was really something. It's been a really special connection. Yeah. So I remember as oh, go ahead, go ahead. Geez, Ben has an interesting history. Uh, it, they were a secluded community that developed quilting on their own, and I'm wondering if they had any unique quilting techniques that were. Uh, discovered in, 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 in when you went down there? Did they were they doing things differently than other quilters across the country? Um, I think what struck me the most is that they use everything. So, you know, their quilts are. I mean, the ones that they've made more currently are just are are mostly fab, just fabric that you know they've taken from pieces of fabric. But um, the ones the sh the quilts that toured. You know, there's there are hunks of, you know, her husband's overalls and there are hunks of work shirts and hunks of flower sacks and all kinds of st stuff built into these quilts. And they're all done by hand. Um, some of the, they piece, they do some of the piecing by machine, but all the quilting is done by hand. And I remember looking at um, one of Mary Ann's, Mary Ann Petway's quilts with her and and she pointed to this piece that was like, couldn't, it was teeny tiny. It was like less than an inch. And she said, oh, I wanted to show you this piece. She said, this is the smallest piece ever. They don't ever throw anything away. They, they build it into those quilts. So you'll find these teeny tiny pieces that other people would probably toss and, and call a scrap, but they don't. So to me, that's what is so unique. They're so beautiful and, and there's so much love in them. Um, yeah, and the hand quilting, you know, all those stitches, all those little hand stitches, it's just really remarkable. Wow. What's yeah. the largest donation that you've ever gotten from a manufacturer? Uh, from a manufacturer? Well, we've had a few. Um, I mean, we've been really well supported by corporate donors. Um, in 2018, uh, Brother gave us 500 sewing machines. And they were all refurbished. What was really remarkable about it was that they all were the same model and yes. refurbished. And the same model, that was just key. It has been such a gift. Um, because then, you know, group supply, we can send out sets of like machines. And it's just so great for people that are setting up like little sewing classrooms and women's shelters or, you know, libraries or wherever they're going to be. Yeah. So I I can understand that when you're wanting to set up a classroom to teach people how to sew that the same machine is so beneficial 
because yeah. it just makes it streamlined to uh, set them up for success. Yes, go brother, yay. Yeah. Uh, but there's other manufacturers that have also donated quite a few. I know that Bernina has sent you some machines as well. Bernina else? Has, um, SVP, Singer, we've, we've received Singers, Singer machines, um, and Brothers and Baby Lock has given mm -hmm. us sewing machines. So we've been very fortunate, very fortunate. And then through through John, um, like a couple of years ago, we um, wanted to collect machines when we were collecting for Houston. Um, and John had some Janomies. And so we, we were gifted some Janomies for that particular collection and distribution. So yeah, the sewing community and, and not just sewing machine brands, but um, thread brands and scissors and, you know, all the tools too. We've benefited so much. I mean, we've, it's been such a gift. Oh, and, and like arrow sewing tables, you know, I, we were, we were helping a group get a, um, a set of machines together for a container that was going to Africa. And so we just needed to get the machines to the container here. Um, and they needed it, all of a sudden, as we were talking about this, and they were really excited, and we said, sure, we'll give you machines, and their mission was super cool. And all of a sudden, we realized, we started looking again at the pictures of the machines they had, and they were all treadle machines. And we said, oh, wait a minute, you need you need machines with no power, right? You, like non-electric. And they said, well, yeah. And fortunately, we had 10, they needed 10 machines. We had 10 machines that we could convert to hand crank machines. So we did that. But then we looked at it again and we thought, but you're sewing on treadle machines and so those have a table and you don't have any tables. <laughs> so I called Arrow Sewing Cabinets and they sent 10 folding tables to put in the container, you know, to go under those machines. Wow. It was really cool. I know that there's a lot of uh, overseas uh, people in need that don't have power. Mm -hmm. And I know there's been a lot of conversations uh, within all brands on our treadle machines that we sell. Right, Dad? We, so you guys still sell, you sell treadles? Yeah, we've never gotten went out of stock on treadle machines, treadle cabinets, treadle hand cranks that you can add to an old spoke wheel singers, and treadle cases, treadle belts, and so forth. So we've stayed in the treadle business for a long time. And we are able to get new treadle machines and cabinets out of China. And the, the machines are like $99. And it's an all metal machine. Yeah. And for some people that don't have power, a hand crank is the option or a pedal machine, pedal cabinet. But you can also add a motor to any of these machines yeah. if you do have power. So it's a good business to stay in because there's always a demand for treadle machines. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's people in need, not only for inspiration, so 4-H, which I'm heavily involved in over here within the past few weeks of doing the judging, but there's people in um, social situations, maybe like battered women yeah. that would use it as a coping mechanism. There's, there's homeless people that need to mend their clothes there's people that need it for income um, for their family, to support their family. So there's so many opportunities here. The machine, uh, the sewing machine is such a creative and inspired tool. You know, it's really remarkable. When you mentioned um, women's shelters, we um, worked with a shelter here in Madison a couple of years ago. And this was for... Um, it was kind of a transient shelter for women who had been um, helped to remove themselves from the sex trafficking trade. And what, what I didn't know, um, what I learned as we worked with this group, so we gave them like 14 machines to have set up in the, the house where they offered therapy and, and counseling and resources and stuff like that. Um, but what I didn't realize was um, that people in these in these really stressful, dire, life-threatening situations had had lost the ability to plan forward. They were living so much in the now, kind of this fight or flight, um, that 
at first sitting down at a sewing machine and trying to plan a sewing project was really hard. And the, the therapist was, it is super gifted. And so kind of used sewing and therapy kind of hand in hand. Um, and the sewing was the tool that allowed people to relearn how to like plan ahead, like to see a goal and work towards it and to believe that they, you know, and then to complete something and know that they could do it. And um, it was just, it was an aspect of sewing that I, I mean, I, I know for sewing is so important to me, but I, I just hadn't thought about that sort of aspect of it. You know, it was, it was yeah. really, it, it's really powerful. Yeah. Barbara, so we got, yeah. Tell them about the the uh, Salvation Army project that we got started in in March before COVID. weren't able to complete it, but it was in in Baton Rouge. They we had donated some machines to Salvation Army, and they used it to teach the men how to sew that had ne to make a quilt that had never done that before. Yeah. Okay. So let me. Um, share my screen and i just want to let you know D delia i got your question and that is an awesome segue into what we're going we're going to tell you all about how you can get involved and donate um but i'll go ahead and i'll show that um on my screen so just one moment okay can y'all yes. see this let's see Oops. yep let me make it full screen Okay, so here's All Brain's blog. We posted a few things here. Um, this is uh, our sewing machine project article that we have with some photos of the donations that we've made to Cuba. And this is like, All Brain's has a very unique, well, let me go down to the first one. I, I, I'm ADD, guys. So just, this is the Salvation Army that you asked about, Dad. Yeah. Um, so there's... Um, is it men and women or just men? Just men. Salvation Army, just men. Yeah. So they are in a unique situation to where they're either just getting out of prison or they are um, have been homeless or come from broken families, substance abuse, all of these kind of things. And they come to the Salvation Army and learn the scripture and then they, they learn life skills and how to get back on their feet again. So this um, awesome individual right here, uh, she is, the art council uh, that group, yeah. yeah, so she's uh, of the art council and she, she just had this great idea. Why don't we teach these men how to quilt? And so the director of the salvation, the program director here uh, met with us to um, get a commitment on supplies and sewing machines. So that wasn't through the sewing machine project, but we were we're inspired to make this world a better place. And this is some of them. And those are the um, that are making a quilt. Yeah. And you know how she got inspired to start this program, Margaret? How? She went into the bunkers and she noticed all of the beds without quilts on them. And she said, wouldn't it be so special for them to be wrapped up in something that they Oh, made together. Um, I love that. So Those yeah, pictures are great. Thank you. Okay, so this is the sewing machine project. So we have a very unique, um, a, a unique partnership, allbrands.com, with the sewingmachineproject.org. Since you need machines that are in good working condition. Mm -hmm. um, we take donations at any one of our seven locations. That's San Antonio, Houston, um, Lake Charles, Lafayette, Baton Rouge, Slidell, or New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, and we bring them to our Baton Rouge location. We service them all so that when we donate them to the Sewing Machine Project, they're in good working condition. So that's a unique program that we have with you guys um, to set set them up for success. So let me uh, absolutely. 
Yeah. And and the and the ones that you receive, I mean, our experience so far pretty much has been um, the ones that you receive are distributed to groups kind of in the area. So that, I mean, John, that's, that's kind of how we've done it so far is the ones that come into, you know, because there are, pl there's plenty of need. So um, that's, you know, other than, other than the ones that we've shipped collaboratively to other, to other places, but most of the time, the machines like the Mardi Gras Indians might come in and pick up some of those machines that you've prepared or the 4-H group, um, you know, so yeah, those, so that's how that works. And and then people, and then people also ship machines to me, but um, the machines that are shipped directly to me, we don't have the benefit of, of a, an all brands, you know, they come right to me. So I ask people to make sure that they're in good working order before they ship it right. so that we receive it that way. Yep. Barbara. Barbara. Sorry. Okay, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I'm trying to correct the audio. Delia asked, um, how can she donate material? And would you like me to show them how on your website, Margaret? Um, sure, I can I can talk about it. Um, okay. I we take we do take fabric. We ask that it's cotton and it's clean and that it's in one yard pieces or larger. Um, so we've, we've kind of identified what, what is really useful, you know, what we find that there's a need for it. So, um, and, and as Barbara's showing you, you can see that um, not like kind of the guidelines for making a donation as well as where to ship it if you have something to donate. So, um, and as far as notions, um, we have kind of narrowed down our list of notions. And again, you can see it there. Um, to what's in a sewing kit, a basic sewing kit. So that is, um, and again, that's all on our website. So we take that sort of thing. Um, we take thread if it's if it's relatively new, um, and we don't we don't take trims. We don't you know stuff like that. We just have found that it we that we don't have the space to store it and we don't have the need for it. So. Um, but things always change, and then we just put it on our website. If we start, if we have a need for something, we put it there. Yeah. So yeah. there's also the donate sewing machines here. Mm -hmm. um, so if they do donate sewing machines, you could put in your location, and it'll put in the closest location. But guys, if you're in Louisiana and Texas, bring your machines to all brands. Absolutely. We don't charge to repair. We do that out of the kindness of our heart, so that we can provide them to the sewing machine project.org to uh, make this world a better place. And the easiest thing and what's you need most, most now, correct? I'm assuming. Yeah. Is just financial donations. And yes. what does that go towards when they um, financial they go to a wide range of things. We um, use them to ship machines. We use them to buy supplies that we haven't received, or if a group needs like all matching some things, we get that. Um, but it goes into the people that you know that need the machines. So it's it's all kind of all around whatever we need to be sent along with machines or machines themselves. Sometimes too, if we receive a machine that's just a really great machine, um, and and there's a a minor thing wrong with it that we're unable to repair. We use that money to pay a, a local technician to just fix it. So yeah, we buy bobbins and we buy needles and you know all the stuff we need to send along with machines. Yeah. So guys, the website is www.thesewingmachineproject.org. Mm -hmm. Margaret Jankowski is the founder, owner spark creator um, <laughs> angel from heaven that's making these good things happen in the world and like dad you always taught me it's not about what happens to you it's how you react to it and thank you for reacting to a sad situation in a way that makes things better for the world and that's just so admirable and we really um, have a lot of respect for you and your organization, and we're honored to um, give the machines and donation to that. Well, so, I, I'm so grateful. And 
you know, when I think back, I mean, really, John, you and I became connected because you reached out and you said, how can I help? And that's, that's what it takes, you know? It takes us reaching out to one another and saying, how can I help? What do you need? <laughs> well, I think it's all about recycling, whether it's recycling clothes or whether it's recycling sewing machines. <clears throat> and a lot of, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of people really put their sewing machines out by the street if they no longer use them. They don't need to do that. We need to recycle sewing machines because I have never, as a mechanic for 45 years, I've never found a machine that couldn't be fixed. So don't throw it away. Donate it to your local sewing machine dealer to either use for parts or to use for donations. But you never need to leave it at the street corner to go into the trash because it needs to be recycled and reused. You know, so please yeah. take advantage of recycling. You know. Yeah. <laughs> So I hate that we have to end this conversation, but is there anything that either of you just want to say before we sign out today? I, I want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. And it's just so good to see both of you. And to see all these comments coming in, I'm so happy that people are listening and watching. Um, the sewing community is amazingly generous and we absolutely, I mean, I had a, an idea that I love, but it never would have gone anywhere without the generosity of the sewing community. So that's People can sew are so awesome. Like, Isn't that the truth? Right? It's so true. It's so true. So yes, I'm good grateful. Folks that sew. Oh my grateful. gosh. So I'm going to uh, mute myself because I want to show a video that really touched my heart. And I think that um, I think that you'll all enjoy it. And I hope that I can do it technology technologically correct. So um, dad, did you want to say anything? No, no, I do my recycling speech, yes. I do. Thank you for what you do. And thank you for being so inspiring to me and so that I can continue this um, tradition of philanthropy. So let me try to share my screen. Thank you. Oops. Sorry. There it is. I'm going to do it. I have to hop out. Hold on just a second. I'm going to hop out. Wow. When I sit down and sew, my hands are busy with this thing that's so familiar. <laughs> it's a magical combination of the, the motor sound and the sound of the needle. It allows my mind to just kind of open up and think about other things. I do a lot of problem solving when my hands are moving at a machine. Solving an unexpected problem set Margaret Jankowski on a course to help mend the world. To me, a sewing machine is so much more than just a tool. Margaret learned that lesson in 2004 when a tsunami ravaged Asia an event made personal through a story about a woman in Sri Lanka. She had lost her sewing machine, her only way to make a living. Something about that article really hit me. Um, initially, as a sewer, I thought, oh, I don't know what I'd do without my sewing machine. But, but reading further and thinking about it more, it was so clear that for this woman, that sewing machine was a tool for survival. So initially, I thought, I'll collect some sewing machines and I'll send them over to Southeast Asia. At the time, Margaret worked at a sewing machine shop in Madison. She tapped the generous spirit of its customers to donate machines to what she named the Sewing Machine Project. Sewing machines are so important to people that it's wonderful when people know that their machine will have another chapter and that it will go to help somebody else. As the first donated machines made their way to Sri Lanka, 
disaster struck closer to home, Hurricane Katrina. I rented a van and my daughter and I drove to New Orleans. I still deliver sewing machines to New Orleans, mainly to the Mardi Gras Indians. It's a, an amazing community. I think there was one year that Mardi Gras, the Mardi Gras parade happened and would not have happened without Margaret taking those machines down there. Today, the sewing machine project is more than just Margaret. In the Madison area, they hold sewing classes for underserved populations. Monica Mims took one of the classes taught by Rebecca Stanley, and today is working with her as an apprentice. I'm just really happy to teach her what I know, and she's very fast. She's a very fast learner. Thank you. It's a great opportunity to, to learn something new and fun. So we offer classes in different spots around Madison, and different groups around the country are interested in offering this too. And we offer them machines, and then they kind of tailor the class to the population that they're serving. In a converted Madison Lutheran Church Sunday school room, Margaret found a storehouse for donated machines. And as you can see, there are sewing machines everywhere. We try to make sure that every single machine, everything on it works. We want our machines to make people happy. We don't want it to be a headache in any way. So our volunteers really carefully go through them and check everything out. We have to be really careful what we send out for machines because we certainly don't want to start a fire in someone's house. Margaret and the Sewing Machine Project's newest effort benefits the public, even if they don't want to touch a machine. All right, we're on it. Yep, no problem. My sewing skills are not good. I can do things by hand. I've never tried a machine. Heaven help us all. Fortunately for Larry Orb, every other Wednesday, the Sewing Machine Project offers free mending, first come, first served, at Madison's Goodman Community Center. These are some of the most popular ladies in the building, actually. <laughs> when I'm mending something for someone, especially people that I'm just meeting for the first time. To me, there's something almost sacred about it. Um, because so often, these are things that are dearly loved. So much trust on the part of the person giving it to us. I would say sacred is the, is the word that I would use. It's, it's really something. Silk long chomps, expertly repaired. Thank you, ladies. I really appreciate this. As Margaret watches the sewing machine project grow and diversify, she sees the common thread making a difference. Whether we are sitting at a table and mending things for people, or we're sitting down next to someone who is learning how to, to use a sewing machine, I can't help but think that there's some little bit of mending going on. You know, it might ease somebody's, somebody else's struggle. It might make somebody else's life easier in some way. I think everybody has the power to do that. We just, we just want to do something that's good. I like that. I love that. <laughs> you were in there. Well, there, there was another project we were involved with after Katrina in making the bags down in uh, Homa. Yeah. We took some in, industrial sewing machines down there so they could make uh, handbags. Now, what was that bag called? The Sea Hope bag. Sea Hope, yeah. Yep. And, yep. Uh, and you arranged for those industrial machines to end up down in Homa so that yeah. we could sew them. They were 12, 12 uh, walking foot and commercial machines portable that were donated from Sailrite up in uh, Indiana. Yep. yep. Uh, they used them to make the bags uh, to commemorate the flood. It was it was after the BP oil spill. So that was 2010. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But we were, yeah, we were trying to figure out how to respond to the oil spill. Yeah. And 
what what we could do is so we thought we would um, we created these bags out of donated sales from people all over the well all over the Madison area really I collected them here and we cut them up and we made them into bags and we sold the bags and raised money for community groups in the affected areas from the oil spill. So yeah. they were cool. They were really beautiful metal bags. Yeah. Yep. Wow. We've collaborated a lot, John. Oh, yeah. We have. <laughs> <laughs> and we will again in the future. So Yay! I wonder what's next. <laughs> so, yes. So y'all stay tuned with the sewing machine project because they have a lot going on. If you, I mean, what, what if somebody wanted to like start their own version of mending classes in their area? I don't know. What do you think, Margaret? Like, like how can we make this bigger than what it already is? Well, anybody that wanted to, like if somebody's inspired by the whole mending idea, which is really pretty easy to get going, um, they could contact me through our website. And we're happy to share a few machines if you need a couple machines for your mending site. We can certainly tell you what we learned as far as, you know, we've, we've kind of had some, um, not, not really big bumps along the way, but we've just learned a lot as we've been developing that program and we've kind of got it going now. Um, not right now, because right now nobody's going anywhere. But um, before COVID, um, we were we were really clipping along and we were busy at all three of those sites. So anyway, if you are interested in starting a mending project, get in touch with me through the website and we can certainly help you out. We have a little, a little proposal form. And <laughs> you have a volunteer cool. already. <laughs> yes. So I remember something when I was young and tell me if this is so a machine project because I didn't have this in my notes. Dad, do you remember when we did the philanthropy where we teamed up with the police department in New Orleans um, and we traded sewing machines for guns? Yeah, I was, was really young. Far back. It was in the 90s and the police chief in New Orleans was from Atlanta and he, he wanted to do a buyback and we offered several hundred machines in exchange for guns. And I worked the first precinct down on Rampart Street, and I got to take in rifles and guns from grandmas who didn't want the guns around their children anymore. And so it was very successful. We we donated 200 machines uh, in exchange for guns, and we haven't done a project like that since, but it really worked well in New Orleans. I, love I remember that. there was an artist that took the, the destroyed guns and oh, yeah. made sculptures out of them so for the longest time we had a t-rex bent gun sculpture in our house and all my friends thought i was crazy and i had to find a way to explain it to them <laughs> so that, that was is fun. super cool well another big project the bigger project the biggest project we've ever been involved in was with in the early 2000s with 4-h foundation in in washington dc uh we had uh, over a thousand machines in uh, at, at Brother Refurb Center up in Memphis, and we donated to the 4-H uh, Foundation, and we sent them all over the country to 4-H agents who wanted them for classes. Whoever wanted machines got them, and including Indian reservations, including uh, ethnic groups in Alaska and Hawaii and Puerto Rico. So we shipped about. Through FedEx, through FedEx at the time, shipped over a thousand machines to these uh, 4-H learning centers or county agents and so forth. So that that but that's been uh, almost 20 years ago that we did that. Wow, that was pre sewing machine project .org. Now we now we refer all of the, everything to you, Margaret, because you're an angel. It's much easier for us to donate machines through sewingmachineproject.org because they're they're a 501c3 organization, so people yeah. can get deductions for the donations, and that's really superior to trying to vet. I mean, it's better for Margaret to vet the people that get the machines than for me to do it because I don't really have time to do it. So it, we we really depend on sewingmachineproject.org to pick the most needy customers. You know. And I depend on you guys for your kindness. You, it's just always, you guys have been such a huge gift to, to me and to the organization. Yeah. So I think we got a win-win going on. Yes, we have. Yeah. Yes, we have. <laughs> so 
sewingmachineproject.org. How do you get involved? Go to their website, click the how do I donate. You can drop off a sewing machine at an all brand, one of all brands seven locations, or there's a few other are there a few other locations that do uh, uh, the repair? There are there are a few in Wisconsin and there's one in New York. But we don't have very many. Most yeah. people from outside of Wisconsin ship them to us. Yeah. Otherwise, you can make a financial donation, or if you have like tons of fabric or whatever you need, like notions that that you have listed on your website, you can contact her through that. If you have any ideas of programs that you want to start to make this world a better place, contact Margaret uh, through the website um, to get something started. Yep. To make this world a better place. And thank you, Margaret. Yay. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you. I really am yeah. grateful. Yeah. All right, everybody. It's been a absolute joy. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. And thank you, Margaret, for what you do. Thank you, Dad, for starting this when it began. Thank you so much. Thank All you. right. Bye-bye. Okay.